Many years ago, I was given the opportunity to step into a new leadership role. On paper, at least, this role seemed like a very natural next step for me. <clears throat> but there was something about it that just didn't sit right. So I called up a friend of mine, took him to lunch, and talked through it with him. Over the course of the lunch, I basically went through this long laundry list of concerns and questions that I had about this role. And at one point, he turned to me and he said, Ryan, let me ask you a question. Deep down, do you see yourself as a leader? This was not a question that I was expecting to get, so I thought about it long and hard. And the answer that I came up with surprised me. I said, you know, I really don't. And I didn't know why that was, because I had lots of experiences, times that I could think of when I had demonstrated my leadership abilities. But for some reason, the label just didn't seem to fit. Now maybe some of you are like me, or at least like I was. And you've had opportunities to lead that you've stepped back from when you should have stepped forward. Because like for me, this label of leader doesn't seem to fit you either. Or maybe that's not you. Maybe you're the kind of person that always says yes to leadership opportunities. But when you look at the world around you, you're disappointed by the fact that not as many people as you would like to see actually do step up and they're willing to lead like you are. In either case, whether you're, whether you're the first kind of person or the second kind, you might wonder why. And I think I have the answer for you, or at least part of the answer. For the last 25 years, I have worked as a social psychologist using data to try to understand the human experience. For the last several years, since coming to the Door Institute for New Leaders here at Rice, I focused my research questions on topics around leadership, including how people become leaders and how they grow and develop their leadership skills. One of the things that I've noticed over the last few years is that many of us, or perhaps most of us, have internalized a set of lies about leadership that affect not only how we see ourselves, but also how we see other people. Now, there's a lot of lies in this space that we can talk about, things that we've internalized that we've come to believe, but I like to focus on three lies in particular. These lies are not only really commonly believed, but I think they're especially important to debunk. And they're powerful in part because each of them contains at least a grain of truth. And those are the kinds of lies that are, that are the most difficult to unbelieve. Now, before I introduce the first lie, let me ask a question for you to think about. Are great leaders made by experience, or are they just born that way? We asked this question to about 3,000 college students. Specifically, do you think that leaders are, do you think that some people are just born great leaders, or do you think that you become a leader through experience and change? And what we found was that some people weren't really sure what they thought, but a substantial proportion of them thought, yeah, you know, I think you're really just born with it or you're not. So they have a fixed view of leadership abilities. Specifically, 37% said you're just born with it or you're not. Now, psychologists have been asking this question, are leaders made or born for a long, long time? And fortunately, there are some really good studies of identical twins that can help us to finally answer this question, are leaders made or are they born? What these studies do is examine the extent to which genes can help to explain who becomes a leader, or what we call leader emergence. What these studies show is that genes do, in fact, help to explain who becomes a leader. In fact, genes can explain about a quarter of the leader emergence story. And that's meaningful, that's significant. But it also means that three quarters of this story is explained by factors that have nothing to do with genetics. Things like experience, and training, and motivation, and opportunity. What is it specifically about our genes that causes some people to enter into leadership roles and others not to? That's actually not clear at this point. It could be something like attractiveness. So we know that attractive people get all kinds of breaks in life. Maybe this is just one of them. It could also be something like testosterone. We know from studies of children that children as young as four years old associate automatically features of masculinity with power and authority. Or it could be something even more ridiculous, like physical height. Height not only predicts who we see as capable of entering into leadership, 
and also predicts who we vote for. Height, in fact, is the single most predictive factor in accounting for who Americans have voted for to be president over the last 120 years, predicting accurately who we elect to be president over 70% of the time. Now, being tall seems like a silly uh, reason to decide that someone should be the leader of the free world, and it is. But it's actually a bias that shows up in all kinds of different ways. It seems to be deeply embedded in our psyches. It shows up in literature. It shows up in art. It shows up in movies. One of my favorite examples of this high bias actually is from the Bible, of all places, where the only thing that we learn about the physical appearance of King Saul, the very first king of Israel, the king that the people elected themselves, they appointed him, was that he was taller than everybody else. He ended up being a terrible king, by the way, not surprisingly. So the lie, lie number one, is that great leaders are just born that way. The truth is, genes do matter, but they don't matter nearly as much as things like experience, and training, and opportunity. And all of this, by the way, is just about who gets to become a leader. It's not about who's a good leader. It's really just about who gets a chance to try. So before I introduce line number two, I'd like to get a little audience participation, if that would be OK, to help uh, develop this idea. What I'd like you to think about is this question. If you had to assign just one personality characteristic to most leaders, what do you think it would be? Now, to make sure we're all on the same page, let's use the broad personality framework known as the Big Five. The Big Five, if you're not aware, includes openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. So you've got 100 bucks, and you've got to put all your money on just one of these personality traits. Which one do you think is most likely to characterize most leaders? Now, let's, let's do a show of hands. Take a little vote here. How many of you pick openness? A couple of people. OK. Conscientiousness? Quite a few. Extroversion? Also a lot. Agreeableness? Just a couple and neuroticism. Very good. So those of you who chose extroversion are in particularly good company. That, was the, that got the most votes in the room. And it turns out that research over the last 50, 60 years has demonstrated time and time and time again that extroversion is, in fact, predictive of who becomes a leader. <clears throat> Line number two, though, flows very nicely from that which is that real leaders are always outgoing. In other words, they're always extroverts. What research shows is that in terms of who becomes a leader, again, leader emerges, extroversion actually predicts about 11%, up to 11% of the story. However, notice that there's another personality factor, one that also got a lot of votes, by the way, that does a slightly better job of predicting who becomes a leader, and that's conscientiousness. It explains up to 13% of the leader emerging story. Notice, by the way, these are the two strongest personality links to leadership emergence. And they don't account for the majority of who becomes a leader. So the other three-fourths of the picture is, again, explained by all these other factors, other personality traits, skills, abilities, motivations, et cetera. If we move from who becomes a leader to who's an effective leader, then extroversion and conscientiousness still show up. They're still the strongest personality traits predictive of leader effectiveness. But together, they only explain it as much as 7% of the leader effectiveness story. So 93% of leader effectiveness is explained by other factors. Now, some research suggests that uh, if, you, if you look at leadership among younger people, among high school students or college students, you find that personality matters just a little bit more in those groups than in older adults. So we decided to take a look at that here at Rice a few years ago. And we looked across campus at seniors who were in formal leadership positions. And we compared them to seniors who were not in formal leadership positions in terms of their levels of extroversion and conscientiousness. And what you can see is, yeah, the leaders were a little more extroverted and a tiny bit more conscientious, but the differences were completely trivial. So line number two is that real leaders are always outgoing. But the truth is, being outgoing is really not all that important in the end to who becomes a leader or who's an effective leader. 
And that's really good news for those of us in the room who don't think of ourselves as raging extroverts and the life of every party. It means that you don't have to be this guy to become a leader <laughs> and to be a good one. Now, when you hear or see the word leader, what's the first thing that comes to mind? What's your primary association? We asked that question of about 900 people who were visiting a local coffee shop. And we took all of their answers and we put them together and, and we created a word cloud out of what they said. And the word cloud shows the most common themes or words or phrases in the, in the biggest font so it will pop out to you. What we, what we see in this word cloud is that, first of all, there's a lot of different ideas that come to mind, a lot, a lot of associations with leadership. But the one that pops out the most, the one that was by far the most frequent, was that leaders are confident. Leaders know what they're doing. They're confident people. And given that, it's probably not surprising that when we next, next ask people, uh, what are you primarily concerned about when you think about stepping into a leadership role? They said, confidence. They have this idea that leaders are supposed to be confident. If I'm not that confident, I must not be a leader. So that leads us to line number three, which is that the most self-confident people make the best leaders. Now, just like lies number one and two, there's a little grain of truth to this. It's hard to imagine, for example, following somebody who is utterly lacking in self-confidence. However, sometimes what appears to be self-confidence is actually just narcissism. And you might say to yourself, don't you have to be at least a little narcissistic to become a leader? It makes sense that you might think that, given that probably a lot of our leaders are a little narcissistic. But no matter how intuitively appealing it is, it's still not true. It turns out that a healthy sense of self-confidence actually derives from a sense of psychological security, whereas the appearance of narcissistic confidence derives from insecurity. And insecurity causes people to do all kinds of foolish, self-serving things that don't make them good leaders. It turns out that to be an effective leader, you actually need humility. There are a number of reasons for this. One of them, I think, is that in order to make really good decisions as a leader, you have to show a little bit of skepticism about yourself. Sort of question your own fantastic ideas, your first impressions, your, your biases and your assumptions. You have to be able to ask really good questions and truly listen to the answers. And that describes a humble leader, not a narcissistic one. So line number three is that the most self-confident people make the best leaders. But the truth is that self-confidence isn't always what it appears to be. And humility can be just as valuable as self-confidence. Now, take a moment to think of examples of leaders that you know or that you know of, who don't seem to fit these lies. They're not always the most outgoing people. They weren't born with all the right qualities. They don't always think that they have all the answers to all the questions. I'm sure you can think of some. I can think of several. One who comes to mind is a guy named Jorge Bergoglio. Uh, a few years ago, when Pope Benedict XVI resigned as pope back in 2013, Jorge was the wrong person for the job to replace him. For one thing, Jorge, although he was a Catholic priest, he was the wrong flavor of Catholic priest. He was a Jesuit, and no Jesuit had ever become pope before. Second of all, Jorge was from Argentina, not from Europe, so he was from the wrong continent, in fact, the wrong hemisphere. But to make matters worse, Jorge had a number of pretty massive public leadership failures from his time in Argentina, when Argentina had been going through some massive social and political upheavals. His leadership failures were actually so big and so public that he had to legally change his name to become Pope. You might know him as Pope Francis. Despite being the wrong guy for the job, wrong in every way on paper, he was still selected to become the leader of the world's largest religious organization. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb and guess that most of you probably can't relate very well to the idea of becoming Pope. So for a little more relatable, down-to-earth example, consider my dear friend, Laricia Hawkins, who's actually a graduate of this university. Laricia is an introvert and also a very talented and award-winning teacher. After she earned her PhD in political science, 
she landed her dream job teaching political science at a small, selective Christian school right outside of Chicago. One evening, Larisha decided to post a picture of herself wearing a hijab on Facebook. And in her post, even though she's not Muslim, she said she was going to wear this hijab during the month of December in order to stand in solidarity with her Muslim sisters around the world who, on a fairly routine basis, get harassed and experience discrimination because of this visible sign of their identities. Well, within days, Larisha began to experience her own form of harassment and discrimination. In fact, within weeks, she had lost her job at this college where she worked, despite having tenure. Now, it would have been possible to save her job if she had apologized and groveled and taken back her Facebook post, taken it down and retracted and said, oh, I made a mistake. She didn't do that. She decided that there was nothing for her to apologize for and that she needed to lead by example. And she needed to teach her students what it meant to lead out of your values, especially when it costs something. Leadership, for my friend Larisha, is wrapped up in her sense of duty and calling, which is bigger than any particular job. And I'm sure you can think of a lot of other examples of leaders who don't really fit the mold. They, they don't match these lies about leadership, about who you have to be, what you have to look like, and how you're supposed to feel. And yet, they nonetheless led effectively and beautifully. And some of them have actually changed the world. I mentioned earlier that there are a lot of lies that we've internalized about leadership. And these are just three of them. I think three of the more pernicious ones. I think that when we look at the world around us and we consider all the important challenges that need great leadership to, uh, to help us overcome them, to help, them, help us fix them, I wonder if it's really a good idea to leave all that leading in the hands of a select few, of people who perhaps match these lies about leadership that many of us have internalized, but who haven't actually developed the capacities and the skills to lead well. And I don't think we can afford that. I think instead what we really need to do is identify all of the lies about leadership that we have internalized, that we believe, and we need to take them and throw them into a dumpster and light that dumpster on fire. <laughs> if we don't, then we are the ones who are responsible for the leadership dumpster fires that we see all around us in business, in education, and in government, aren't we? I think that if we want to fix what's wrong in our communities, and if we want to make the world a better place for everyone, then it's time that we become unbelievers of these lies about leadership. Thank you.